Inspiration and Insights from Frontline Ministry to the Nations is a podcast of Wheaton College, Illinois that features Wheaton College Graduate School alumni, primarily Billy Graham scholars around the world. The title reflects the nature of Jesus, the Son and Word of God being sent to the nations, and his followers also being sent to the nations. Please let us know you're listening by engaging on social media. Like, follow, share, subscribe, and comment. You can find us on beaten.edu slash listen, and most places podcasts are found. For scholarship information for Wheaton College Graduate School, please visit beaten.edu slash Billy Graham Scholarships. Hello, my name is April McLaughlin. I'm the Billy Graham Scholarship Program Coordinator here at Wheaton College Graduate School in Wheaton, Illinois. Thank you for listening today. I used to have this phrase ready when I was sharing in Bible studies, something like, I'm not a theologian, but I think it was after I took a Christian theology class at the grad school here at Wheaton that I realized that wasn't really true. In fact, I found that R.C. Sproul wrote a whole book entitled Everyone's a Theologian because he said, quote, every time we think about a teaching of the Bible and try to understand it, we are engaging in theology. We're actually going to go to Austria in a way and talk with Jim Hatcher, who just completed his PhD in educational leadership. His dissertation is a case study of 35 years of church-based training in Austria from 1983 to 2018, has a strong historical component connected to one of the most significant periods of growth in the Austrian evangelical movement. Jim graduated from Wheaton in 1984 with a master's in communication. He received the Billy Graham Prefield Missionary Award. He is now the regional leader for Central Europe for Greater Europe Mission. So even though I'm admitting I'm technically, I guess, a theologian, as we all are, I do feel quite inadequate to talk with you, Jim, about international theological education. So I'm going to rely on your grace and trust that you'll have a lot of wisdom to share with our listeners from your many years of cross-cultural ministry, your leadership experience, and your recent research. So thank you so much for your time today, Jim. I'm very happy to be with you, April. Would you just um, fill us in a little more on any biographical information you'd like to share? My wife and I studied at uh, Wheaton Graduate School, uh, as uh, as you already mentioned, back in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, so we've been in Austria for quite a long time. My background is as an educator. Before that, I grew up in a missionary family, so I have a I'm an MK. My my father was with MAF Mission Aviation Fellowship in Mexico. Though my mission work is nothing like my father's mission work. That's a deep history of missions in your family. And you said something about even your name. Uh, So my parents went to Wheaton in the 40s. My parents were friends with some of the well-known names in missions back in the 40s. Jim Elliott, Ed McCulley, and Nate Saint. My name, Jim, is named after Jim Elliott, and my middle name is Edward after Ed McCulley. I didn't get uh, Nate Saint in there because uh, my older brother was born first and right after the incidents that happened in Ecuador in uh, 1956. Uh, so he, he got Nate in his name, but that's a big part of our family history is the connection that we have to that story. Maybe at the end, I'll ask you to fill that story in just a tad more for people who might not know the story. And you received our um, Billy Graham Prefield Missionary Award, which is the one that we have that you don't need to have a lot of missions experience because we're investing in people who plan to go long-term on the field, and you certainly did that. So thank you so much for taking your scholarship and your Wheaton education and investing it in uh, so many years of ministry. My wife and I both benefited by the scholarship. There was a, a scholarship, it was called the, the Herman Scholarship, uh-huh. it was started uh, the second year that we were at the grad school, and uh, we were, um, Lynette and I were the first two recipients of the Herman Scholarship uh, as it was launched, and we were very, very grateful. It allowed us to complete our studies. Oh. We look back on that as a great provision of God. Oh, that's great. So then did you graduate debt-free? Yes, we did. Awesome. So you could deploy. That's That was the idea. That's right. Well, you've been serving in Greater Europe Mission, living in Austria. Now you're the um, regional leader for Central Europe. That's right. So what countries do you oversee? 
I am responsible for the Greater Your Mission staff and ministries from Germany and Switzerland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Romania, and soon we'll be adding Slovakia to that list. There's a, probably about 80 missionaries in my region with Greater Your Mission, and there's about 400 missionaries with Greater Your Mission altogether. Okay, so that's a big chunk of them. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move into your PhD studies then. Once again, you did a PhD in educational leadership. You did it at Columbia International University in Columbia, South Carolina, but it sounded like you studied remotely. Was that it? Uh, it, it was not remotely. Uh, it was at a campus in Germany. A CIU has a partnership with a school in, in Germany called the Akademie für Weltmission, Academy for World Mission, near Stuttgart. Mm. I attended courses there. They were modular, uh, one week there, and then a remote study before and after. And overall, how long did it take you to do your studies? Mm, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think about eight years from start to finish. Wow. You know, I'm I was working basically full time in ministry program was designed to do it while you're engaged in ministry. It it's very, was very practical that way. Okay. Could you give us an overview of what you studied and why it was important for you to study this topic? Mm. Well, the degree is in educational leadership, but uh, the focus was really international theological education. And when we first came to Austria, back in 1986, we were helping a ministry that was just starting, that was training church leaders in the context of their local churches in a country that had very few evangelical churches. Over the years, as, as, we, as this program grew and developed, and I became involved in different leadership levels, I realized that we also needed to understand what our goals and, and how to how to pursue theological education in a context that was different than it would be in Germany or in the United States. Austria is kind of a unique place for ministry in some ways. And, and so I needed to understand that, and that drove me to want to learn more about international theological education, particularly when it came to non-traditional forms of theological education, like the kind we were doing, which I refer to as church-based. It's a non-formal kind of theological education that we're doing. I guess this is actually the most important thing, April, is I have a passion for the local church here and for the growth of the kingdom of God in Austria. And I just see the equipping of people for ministry as an essential part of that. And that's really my deepest motivation that drove me to engage in, in the ministry that we do here and then engage in the study of non-traditional forms of theological education. Okay, let me go back. I wasn't sure I picked up what organization was doing the non-traditional church-based education yeah. when you first went to Austria. Okay. Yeah, I can. Uh, I fill that in. I, I don't think I mentioned it okay. here. Here in Austria, around the early 1980s, a number of independent, what we call free churches, also identifying themselves as evangelical, had sort of formed a, an association, working together for some things. And one of the things they were trying to address was the need to train leaders in their churches, and that led to the formation of a working group to develop theological education that would be really practical for church movement. There were many churches being planted at that time and, and churches without leaders, or without trained leaders. Mm. And so they developed a program called BAO, Biblische Ausbildung am Ort is the, is the German name, which roughly translates to biblical education or biblical training on location. It's, it's a little bit like a theological education by extension. And so that organization, BAO, is the organization that we came to work with in, in 1986. Were you pretty impressed with what they had going then? Is that what sort of inspired you? Well, I think what inspired me was uh, the fact that there was two things I really loved, <laughs> and that was uh, the local church and training and, and teaching, and, and this combined those two. The ministry itself was just brand new. Okay. It only had two courses in the curriculum. Uh, it was just a small team, but there was just a dynamic going on, and they were really looking for people to help with the ministry. Everyone who was working in it had other ministries and tasks they were doing. And so I was really the first one who was helping with this ministry on more or less a full-time basis. I see. So that's why you mentioned maybe having to think through the goals and where you were going with it. 
because you came in sort of at the beginning? Yes, but my, my studies were really more of a, of a review ah. of the past uh, because this is 35 years into that ministry and we've experienced a huge movement of churches interested in this ministry at the beginning. Austria has a very small evangelical community, but over the years, over 6,000 Austrians have participated in this program. And so it really was a huge part of many churches, church life, and, and it was integrated in, into many churches and, and individuals and leaders. But around uh, 2004 to 2012, the ministry began to experience decline. And so my study also ask the question about why did that happen and what is needed for the future. So I, I was really focusing on what the purpose of the ministry was, how to maybe reinvent the ministry for the future and not just rest on what happened in the past. 6,000 plus participated. That's, yeah. That is exciting. And then the decline. So what did you find out about the decline? Well, it's always a mixture of things. Like any, mm. like anything, when you have a, a run into a problem, you find that there are a lot of factors that have led into that. One of the factors is just like many ministries, really wrestling with the lack of resources. In 2004, the BAO ministry, which is a non-traditional form of theological education, some of our team members wanted to establish a more traditional school to meet a sort of a higher level of theological education than we were able to do with BAO. And so about half of our team developed and established a Bible uh, school. And while it was exciting and God really blessed that ministry, it did take away resources from the BAO team. That was one part of it. Another part is just, you know, society has changed an awful lot in 35 years. And uh, in those 35 years that I'm that I studied, you know, the whole world entered the digital age. Yeah. So theological education, which you know looked one way in the mid 80s, looks quite different in the year uh, 2021. Also, Austria has changed. The, the churches are different than they were before. The demographics are different. The East opened up. If you remember your history, in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down, and Austria was used to be at the kind of the this uh, cul-de-sac in Europe. It was sort of a dead end here, and all of a sudden it became the crossroads of East and West. Always had been historically, but that was a whole new level. Our churches have changed demographically because of that. It's been really challenging for these things. So we just haven't had the resources. We haven't uh, been able to update some of our, our material, had a weakened staff. But we're also, some of our key personalities that drove that ministry at the beginning moved into, retired or moved into other ministries. And so that changes things as well. So did you come up with recommendations? Yes, I did. One of those recommendations is to reevaluate the particular curriculum that we offer to uh, update those aspects of the curriculum that are really relevant and current for our churches. What the church needs is really what needs to drive the program. The material has not been updated in many years, so that is one thing that we have to invest in. And also to you know take advantage of, of the digitalization of materials. Our courses are all on paper, so to be able to change that. Mm -hmm. Another recommendation is really to be much more engaged in a visual way with our local churches, to be actively a part, to go out into the community with our churches, to have those conversations with many of the new leaders who may or may not be familiar with the program. Mm. The program was very impactful for those who are probably 35 years old or older mm -hmm. now, but newer leaders coming into our churches are not as familiar with the program, and so they look for other resources. And there are many resources, online resources. We never had that before. Mm -hmm. So those are things just to be present, be active in the marketing aspect was is a very important recommendation. And I think the third thing, and this is where my heart really is, that our churches have probably moved away from being learning communities to being a little bit more consumer communities. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the vision and purpose of what we do is tied up in the understanding of the church as, as a learning community. My recommendation is that we actually become, in a sense, uh, people in our ministry who are trying to cast a vision for learning communities in our local churches. And with that is winning church leaders to the value of their role in training leaders mm -hmm. and, and equipping the saints. So those are probably the three major recommendations that came out of the study. Yeah, that sounds really good. 
I'm curious, where are the other leaders being trained if not through BAO? Well, it's a, it's, it's a very good question. We still have churches that have lay leadership, mm-hmm. and those are the ones we really were targeting from the beginning is mm-hmm. to help them. But uh, more and more, we have leaders that are coming either from Switzerland or Germany through Bible schools and seminaries, and some of them here in Austria, but Austria has never been very successful at keeping a Bible school or a seminary going. And when BAO started, there wasn't anything. Mm. So BAO stepped into that gap. We had the Bible school that BAO helped start, which was called the Evangelical Academy here in Austria. And that helped to serve that need. But most of our leaders are getting their training outside of Austria. Mm. They don't necessarily have the DNA of the Austrian experience, which BAO Mm. was a part of that. Interesting. Um, So that's why being more present in the churches, being more active in it, talking to, to the new leaders about the value of having an Austrian education, leadership, and ministry formation Mm -hmm. would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And also you mentioned that the church needs should drive the curriculum. So what what do you see that the church needs are right now? I know it's beyond the scope of your dissertation, 2021, Mm -hmm. but what would you say? that's that's, That's a really good question. I would say in reference to what I said before about churches being consumer Mm -hmm. rather than learning communities, what the churches really need is probably to understand theological education as a part of its mission to make disciples. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes we think of theological education sort of as a silo. You know, we have leadership training that people like to think of as a thing in of of itself. Theological education, we sort of outsource to schools Mm -hmm. and seminaries. That's typical. And I value schools and seminaries. I have, I'm a beneficiary (laughs) of that as we're talking about right now from Wheaton Graduate School and other schools schools. Uh But churches have often outsourced the responsibility of training up their own leaders and equipping the saints, as it says in Ephesians 4, for ministry. And they've outsourced that to institutions that are outside the church. And I think those institutions really need to serve the church better. And the churches need to take ownership of their role of equipping. That's probably what the churches need the most is that vision and mobilization and equipping of of lay people in the church to do the ministry. You mentioned at the beginning, April, how you are, uh, that everyone's a theologian, (laughs) uh, according to R.C. Sproul. And in the same way, because we are all disciples of Jesus, we're all followers of Jesus, we all have a mission. Mm -hmm. And the mission really goes beyond being the consumer of of spiritual goods Mm -hmm. to the giving of spiritual truth and of training and of equipping and of character and building and becoming more like Christ. And that process is something that we can do and our churches need the help of people to come alongside and inspire that vision in their local churches. And that's something I think BAO can do, as well as give them tools to do that in a practical way in their churches, which is what we are trying Mm -hmm. to offer. Yeah, it seems like you're making a case for both traditional and non-traditional education. There's a place for both of them, absolutely. I would say oftentimes we think of People who are in formal education see church-based training or non-formal education as sort of the stepchild Mm -hmm. of education. I would reverse that, and I would say that theological education is really a subset of the discipling mission of the church. Mm -hmm. And to see it as a servant of the church and a subset of the discipling mission of the church, whether it's formal or or non-formal. But the non-formal part is the way you do it if you're going to be in the church while people are engaged in life and ministry and family and jobs, Mm -hmm. and they still need to be equipped. Mm -hmm. That's my sort of argument, my plaidoyer for uh, church-based training, which really elevates the role of the church, which is a passion of my heart. Yeah. I admit, when I heard church-based training, I thought Sunday school, right? But (laughs) honestly, if you go to church consistently, that's a lot of hours in your life, and it's investing in you, and it's Mm. stored there that God can use and draw out when he needs to. So these non-traditional but even the informal is what you're saying happens at church, right? Yes, right. That definitely does. Yeah. I mean, when we think of Sunday school for children, we want to see our children grow in their faith and become mature believers. If we see that as, in a way, the building block 
from being a mature believer, which is more of a receiver of training Mm -hmm. and education, to becoming a disciple maker, which as we grow in our faith, that becomes our next thing we do. We see, oh, I'm not just a disciple, I'm a disciple maker. Mm -hmm. That is our next step towards the level of vision and training that we need in theological education, is to see ourselves Mm -hmm. as disciple makers. Oh, and we're not given permission to do that very much. Right. We need to really empower. <laughs> we, we often say empower the laity. Uh, and I think that's valid and, and a good way to say that, especially in churches that have strong professional type leadership. But most of our Austrian churches don't have that. So when we say empower laity, we're saying empower everyone, including the leaders, and empower and equip them to be disciple makers. And then not only disciple makers, but to be teachers of the word and people leading our churches and leading the movement towards really impact the society at large. And it really is a mission-oriented and mission-driven vision. Mm -hmm. So I've heard people say that you can even train and train and disciple through social media. What do you think about that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Probably, you know, Paul says that we can train people and teach people through songs and hymns and spiritual songs. That's Colossians 3. And if we can do that through music, I'm sure we can do it through social media. Every platform Uh offers an opportunity for becoming more like Christ uh, and, and learning and growing. Paul said in Colossians 1, his ambition, is his, his effort is poured into presenting everyone complete mm. in Christ. Mm. And that's really the thing that drives me, I think, in my heart, is to see everyone really complete in Christ, holistically discipled and equipped and empowered to make other disciples and to fulfill the mission that God has given us. Mm -hmm. So it seems like that passion is sort of at a an interesting point with our culture, right? And the mm. church the way it is right now. So is that part of your dissertation, maybe part of your day-to-day prayer life? Like, how do I do this nowadays, Lord? <laughs> yes, I, I think it is. Um, we, we certainly live in, in difficult times for the church. The, the context in Austria is different than the context in North America. So it, it's probably not good to generalize over broadly, mm-hmm. but uh, these are challenging times, and to know how there's a sense of competition for people's attention, mm. and a lot of people spend a lot of time on social media. They spend a lot of time in isolation, which we had during COVID, especially that individualistic kind of approach to learning, which probably doesn't promote the learning community that we'd like to see our churches become. So these are issues that we all face that hamper our ability to implement a program like church-based training in Austria, but also just to help our churches to become healthy and mission-oriented. Yes. Do you have any glimmers of what is working and what the culture is really clamoring for deep down? Well, that's a that's a really important missional question. I've become, a, I, I think, a little bit cynical over the years uh, of being in missions and seeing people offer sort of solutions that they've had experienced in other places and they bring them and and try to transplant them here. One thing that has changed in Austria, and that is that, you know, evangelicals used to be perceived as a cult here. We we are a very small number of people, but it's really probably doubled in the last 35 years or so. And we've also become recognized by the government in a legal way. That has actually raised the profile in Austrians who are quite suspicious of cults. Mm. It's it's becoming more and more secular mm-hmm. and, and less and less connected to its historical Catholic roots. But it does mean that people are not necessarily inoculated. Mm. Uh, some of them are more open and curious about new ideas. And spiritual conversation can ha- sometimes happen now in ways that it didn't happen mm. in the early mm-hmm. years. So yeah, there are there's a great need. People are lonely and mm. People are uh, needing to find a place where their spiritual needs are are met, and they often look in non-traditional religious experiences, not in the Bible. So bringing the Bible into people's lives is a big challenge, (laughs) Uh, but it it is definitely worth it. I I just see the transformation that can happen in people's lives. But it's slow going Mm -hmm. here in Austria, Mm -hmm. absolutely. But I appreciate your perseverance, both you and your wife and your whole family over there and your passion, I still hear it, and uh, your support of all those workers and all the educational um, initiatives and wisdom that you have to share there. Yeah, thank you for all those years, Jim. Thank you, April. Yeah. It's been a privilege. It really has been. 
Yeah, God's God's been very gracious to us in these years, and mm-hmm. we just uh, are so thankful that we get to be here and get mm-hmm. to do this and be a part of this great endeavor. You had talked about famous missionaries <laughs> who you were named after, Jim Elliott and Ed McCulley and yeah. Nate Saint. Would you please fill us in just a little bit? Back uh, in the 40s and 50s, th- there was a great mission movement. These three men went to Ecuador uh, along with two others, and th- they worked together on a particular project to reach into a tribe that had been isolated and hostile to foreigners. And uh, this tribe, the Wudani, is what they are known as. It's their own name for themselves. But they were called by other names, the Aukas, uh, which was not a very flattering name oh. to call them very savage. Oh. And so this group of missionaries w- wanted to reach them. And so they made contact with a, one of these tribes hidden in an isolated way in the jungles. Um, the five men were killed in January of 1956 mm. by warriors from this tribe. Uh, one of those was Nate Saint, who was a pilot with MAF. And my father was also with MAF. The Nate Saint and my father joined MAF at the same time. And, oh. and they, they, they shared that journey together. And uh, so these were were all friends wow. with my parents in the Wheaton years oh. and then and then of course they were colleagues Nate Saint and my father were colleagues in, in MAF uh, so we have that really close tie yeah that's quite a story and then uh, Jim Elliott's wife went back with mm-hmm. with her Eliz- children Elizabeth and, Elliott with her daughter mm-hmm. yes and reached the tribe helped reach yeah the tribe. she uh, went into the tribe and she had a huge impact of course uh, Rachel Saint who was uh, sister to Nate Saint was also a part of that effort and God just had, did wonderful things there it's a great story I highly recommend Elizabeth Elliot's mm-hmm. uh, books on on that yeah it, it was a moving event it really was that the the murder of the men was not only newsworthy across the world but many many people dedicated their lives to serve the lord in missions because of that mm-hmm. they died but it was it was not for nothing mm-hmm. exactly yeah that was quite a powerful era in missions wasn't it yes yes it was in fact you mentioned that gem was also birthed then. Yeah. Was that in the 40s that that started? Yeah, in 1949, Greater Europe Mission was launched. The founder of our mission, Bob Evans, along with Billy Graham and Dawson Trotman, they met in Biotenberg, Switzerland, and sort of uh, launched the ministry. It was kind of an outgrowth of the Youth for Christ movement in Europe at that time, and it started as a Bible school in Paris, training those in Europe to reach Europe. Today, Greater Your Mission is focused primarily on church planting and discipleship ministries, but it still has a theological education component, and that's where I'm at home. So I love the combination of the church and discipleship mm-hmm. as well as theological education. I love to bring mm-hmm. them all together, so it fits very well. Yeah, that makes sense. And if people wanted to learn more about GEM or your ministry or get involved or contact you, how would they do that? Greater Your Mission has a website which is easily accessible just to Google Greater Your Mission. I'm also accessible. We'd love to see people come and join us with theological education in Austria, especially in church-based training. We really desperately need people to come and work with us in this ministry. My name, Jim.Hatcher at gemission.org. Oh, very good. Great. Any other book or resource recommendations? If you're interested in church-based training as a concept, the book called The Leadership Baton. It's a website, CCBT. Dot org that ch- stands for Centers for Church Based Training. Dot org for English speakers. That's probably a good place to go. Sounds great. And would you lead us in a brief prayer for Austria and Europe? I'd love to, April. Thank you for asking. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the huge impact and the the growth of the church here in Austria in the last 30 or 40 years. So much has happened and we're grateful for it. Thank you for your the work of your spirit and the many people who've come to faith and the churches that have been started. We look to you for the future. And Lord, we we know that every church is uh, is just one generation from dying out if the next generation is not trained and equipped and discipled. And so we we pray for the next generation here in Austria. We pray that you will raise up leaders and raise up people who have a heart for your word and a heart to disciple others in our churches here, that Austrians would be equipped and empowered for ministry. And we just pray for healthy churches, healthy leadership, strong testimony in an increasingly difficult and hostile world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Jim. I think you've inspired us to make disciples. Good. (laughs) 
Thanks, April. <laughs> That's what that that if I if I've done made any contribution to that, that that would make me very happy. Thank you for listening. My little granddaughter is less than one year old, but she's learning how to feed herself by watching her parents. It's messy, but she's experiencing a whole new world of tastes and textures. Quite the adventure. If an adult doesn't feed him or herself, there's a developmental delay for sure. Jim reminds us that baby believers also need to develop from being fed, being consumers of spiritual goods, to feeding themselves and then feeding others. Join us next time for Marina's story of her experience with the riots in Kazakhstan. I believe this is the prayer needed for this time, Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe.